Okay, great. Uh, now let's get started. I'm Dong Song, professor in computer science at UC Berkeley and the co-chair of iClear 2020. It is my great honor and pleasure to have Yang Lekun and Yusha Banjo here with me in this Turing session. As many others, I have been deeply inspired by Yang and Yushua's work. So first, let me take the honor to introduce Yang and Yushua. Yang Lekun is chief AI scientist at Facebook. He joined Facebook in late 2013 to become the founding director of FAIR. He's also a silver professor at New York University, mainly affiliated with the NYU Center for Data Science and the Quran Institute of Mathematical Science. After uh, being a postdoc at the University of Toronto, he joined AT&T Bell Labs uh, in 1988. He became head of the Image Processing Research Department at at and Labs Research in 1996 and joined NYU as a professor in 2003. He was the founding director of the NYU Center for Data Science and is a co-director with Yushua of the Neural Computation and Adaptive Perception Program of CIFAR. Yushua Benju is computer science professor at University of Montreal and scientific director of Milan. He has been passionate about understanding intelligence and learning since he read some of the early neural network papers of Jeff Hinton in the mid 80s when he was a grad student. This passion has led to a long and fruitful career at University of Montreal and his thriving institute and deep learning powerhouse, Milan. As a pioneer and the leader of deep learning, Yushua has been recognized with numerous awards and honors, including the Turing Awards with Jeff and Yang and most recently fellow of the Royal Society. Yushua also has contributed to thinking about the societal and ethical impacts of AI and about acting with AI for social good. For example, with the Montreal Declaration for the Responsible Development of AI and his recent work on climate change, humanitarian and medical applications of AI. Let's welcome uh, Yang and Yushua. Okay, great. Um, so uh, one thing I wanted to briefly mention, um, so this is a Turing session. Uh, originally, ICLEAR was uh, a plan to uh, take place in Ethiopia, so Jeff uh, Hinton couldn't join. And so that's why Jeff couldn't be uh, with us. Uh, then when we set up the conference schedule, uh, Jeff uh, wasn't a part of the session. And uh, we certainly hope to include Jeff uh, in a later conversation together. Okay, so to first get started, um, I have, uh, I, uh, we, uh, we can start uh, by talking about some, some of the secret sauce that Yang and Yushua has identified about uh, winning the Turing Award. So Yang, I heard that you identified a few common traits between you and uh, Yushua uh, that are unique among Turing uh, laureates. Uh, you are the only two who were born in France the only two who were born in the 1960s, and the only two whose first name starts with a Y, and the only two whose younger brothers work at Google. And also you apparently have the same favorite movie. Uh, so which movie is that? 2001 Space Odyssey. Exactly, <laughs> 2001 Space Odyssey. Great, so now we've learned the secret sauce of uh, uh, being Turing Award winners. <laughs> Spurious features, I think. Okay, <laughs> right. Um, thanks. So, so now uh, let's dive into the into the questions. So first, uh, let's look back. Uh, so, uh, Yang and uh, Yoshua. So, the first question is: uh, What problems did you imagine neural networks would be useful for when you initially worked on them? And in particular, also, what convinced you to continue working on them? through all of the hype cycles? Were you ever doubtful about what neural networks could achieve, especially in the earlier days? Um, well, I think, go ahead, go ahead Jan. Jan. Well, I think when you're young, fearless, naive, and ambitious, uh, you think you can solve all the world's problem, or, or you hope you can. Of course, you quickly confront yourself to reality, and you, kind of, you, know, you have to sort of reorganize your ambitions. But, uh, but basically, you know, I got into this because I was interested in uh, the mystery of intelligence, you know, how, um, 
you know, how did human intelligence uh, emerge? Uh, what, what, you know, makes us intelligent? How is it that intelligence can emerge from basically what looks like a self-organizing system, you know, where a large number of very simple elements and in interaction, the, the sort of scientific question behind this, I thought was, uh, uh, was really kind of fascinating. And, and the fact I got interested in learning because I don't think intelligence can be separated from running. I was very sort of either lazy or uh, humble about the human ability to engineer an intelligent machine. I never thought that was possible. And so for me, learning was kind of a necessity. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, and coming back to the question, in those early days, I was certainly not thinking about applications of AI or machine learning. Exactly as Jan, I was thinking about understanding intelligence and uh, what attracted me to the field was the idea that that might be a few simple principles based on learning, which could give rise to intelligence. And this uh, just was such a strong possibility that uh, could change the world, but also uh, help us understand who we are as humans, that it, it gave me a lot of uh, strength and passion for this, for this research. Ah, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. And uh, so then through all the hype cycles, as we all know, um, uh, for a long period of time, neural networks was out of favor uh, through the hype cycles. So were you ever doubtful during that period what neural networks could eventually achieve? Not at all. Mm, not really, no. Um, I mean, uh, I guess both Jan and I had hands-on experience and a strong intuition that uh, these things uh, worked and could work even better. And in my case, I actually spent a few years trying to understand the limitations of uh, competing methods based on kernels to get a better mathematical understanding of what neural networks could bring in terms of generalization, which was not obvious with, with the, the methods that had taken over in the 90s. Yeah, there was never any doubt. Uh, in, in my mind, because, you know, as, as Joshua said, we had, uh, ex you know, empirical experience with it. We knew those things worked uh, and we knew that scaling them up would uh, make them work even better. I think what I had doubt about, which I still have very <laughs> doubt, you know, a lot of doubt about, um, which I actually is the topic of, of, of my keynote, uh, is about supervised learning. And I had the same doubt about reinforcement learning. So the, the form of learning that humans and animals seem to employee is not the kind of learning that we know how to do with machines today. So that's the kind of doubt I have. But, uh, but the idea that, uh, first of all, machine learning was the, the way to kind of more intelligent machines. Second of all, that uh, the main problem in, in machine learning was, you know, learning representations, which is the topic of this conference uh, that Joshua and I named, okay, <laughs> for that reason. And um, created. <laughs> right. Uh, and, uh, and third, the fact that, um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, this whole thing worked and, and needed to be scaled up. There was never any doubt in my mind. The, the other doubt that I had was our ability to convince the rest of the world that this was the case. And, you know, for 10 years, uh, uh, that was kind of a serious doubt, um, you know, between the mid nineties and the mid 2000, basically nobody else. Uh, I mean, very, very few people were working on this kind of stuff. And it was the, the subject of, uh, of, uh, mockery sometimes actually. And rejections. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Uh, I guess this is the other you know, unique uh, trait that you two uh, shared, uh, which is this strong conviction um, of, uh, of the direction. Yeah, that, that, may be, that may be correlated with getting a Turing Award. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yes, and now the spheres uh, features. Um, Okay, so now, decades later, as we all know, deep learning has enabled breakthrough results in many applications. So what results using deep neural networks were you most surprised to learn about? Well, uh, I, I have one example, um, or a number of examples. Uh, originally, I thought um, things like convolutional nets would work for sort of category level recognition with a small number of categories. And now we see applications where uh, neural nets basically can classify very sort of fine grain, can do very fine grain classification with tens of thousands of categories. And I had no idea that this could work. Even though I kind of worked on techniques to do this in the past using Siamese nets, you know, using those, what we now call contrastive methods where you 
try to train a network to find an embedding in such a way that a simple distance can tell you whether two objects are semantically similar or not. But uh, I, never thought, I never thought you could use this for, let's say, face recognition, which, of course, is an application that has good size and bad size. Uh, but it works amazingly well. Uh, I was very surprised by that. And then I'm also very surprised by you know, all, the, all the things that people thought about uh, in the last few years uh, in terms of applications that, uh, uh, I mean, there's new ones every day, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of completely surprised by it, many of them. So, so there's one that um, really surprised many of us. And here I'm going to channel Jeff Hinton. It's machine translation. Yeah, uh, I agree with that. A lot of people thought that in order to do machine translation reasonably well to anything close to the level we currently have, uh, you, need, you needed symbol, explicit symbol manipulation. And a lot of the work, you know, uh, in doing machine translation for many decades was based on that and rules and grammars. But it turned out, uh, as, as the work that, that my collaborators and I did showed, and then a lot of other groups uh, later uh, or in parallel, like the Google group, um, that particular forms of recurrent nets and then transformers can actually perform very, very well without nowhere uh, explicit manipulation of symbols, uh, relying instead on the power of distributed representations. By the way, this this thing, this idea of distributed representations really is something that we, we owe a lot to Jeff Hinton. Uh, instead of crediting him with backprop, we should crediting him, we should be crediting him for this the notion of distributed representation and how important it is for the ability of uh, neural nets to generalize. And this is how in the early 2000, um, you know, I got into using neural nets for language modeling, which eventually was the basis of, of the you know, current uh, work we did, more recent work we did with machine translation and, and now is found in the commercial translation everywhere. Yeah, I totally, I totally agree with this. I, I didn't mention translation because I knew Joshua would talk about it, but, um, uh, but I think uh, that's that's one of the big uh, challenges of the next few years is to basically get uh, uh, machines that at the same time can learn and can learn to reason. And distributed representation, I think, are our best bet for that. Uh, you know, without necessarily so essentially, you know, how how to do reasoning, the equivalent to symbolic reasoning with uh, patterns of activities uh, of a vector or or something like this is the is the big question. I think the conceptual question of the next few years. And, and, and there's it, only results big... that show that very interesting stuff. Don, you you worked on this too, so you know you know a lot about that. And it's a big part of what I talked about in in my uh, presentation for iClear today. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yes, we are all, uh, we all continue to be surprised at how powerful uh, this type of techniques can be. So so now, uh, Yang, uh, could you share your story of how you invented ComNet? Okay. Um, well, you know, it's a it's a long story. When I was an undergrad, I was interested in uh, you know in, in machine learning and AI. And I mean, machine learning was not really a thing at the time. There were people doing like symbolic machine learning, but it was really not very successful at the time. There was something called statistical pattern recognition, which was closer, which kind of the direct descendant of all the work on the perceptron and things like this. Um, and uh, it was pretty clear, you know, I was, I was reading the old literature because I was doing this in around 1980 and there were no contemporary publications on the topic. And so the literature I was reading was from the 50s and the 60s. And it was pretty clear back then that people were looking for learning algorithms for multi-layer architectures. The, some of the early perceptrons were multi-layer, but the first layers were kind of handcrafted or randomly connected. And, you know, everybody said, you know, it would be great if we could like learn the features, if we, if we had, if we could, you know, train multi-layer systems. And so that's what I basically got obsessed by. And, and so that led to, uh, you know, versions of backprop, but um, also, you know, reading neuroscience it was pretty clear that, um, and, 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 you know, classical signal processing, uh, you had this idea that uh, uh, images have kind of a lot of local structure. And so extracting local features is really kind of something that is very uh, useful, interesting, powerful, you know, convolutions have been used for a long time in signal processing. Uh, so, and then you look at uh, classic work in neuroscience by uh, Huber and Wiesel and realize that they had this idea of, uh, uh, you know, kind of local receptive fields. I mean, it was experimental result from neuroscience. And, and they had this kind of concept of 
uh, convolution, nonlinearity, and, and essentially what we now call pooling, which they call uh, complex cells. Um, and then I stumbled on, on this paper, which actually appeared while I was kind of interested in this by, uh, by Fukushima on the neocognitron, where you kind of you know, put this thing in, in layered architectures. And so what he was missing was a multi-layer learning algorithm. And I said, that's, that's what we need to do. We need to be able to train those things in supervised mode because you know, that, that would be the right thing to do. Uh, Fukushima didn't have a supervised learning algorithm. All the, all the layers uh, were trained unsupervised except the last one, which was trained uh, supervised. Um, and, and so that's basically what I tried to do. And it took me a few years before you know, I, I could show that it worked. And you know, kind of backprop emerged uh, uh, as a result of this in my mind. And then I discovered you know, people like Jeff and, and others who were kind of working on, on backprop also. And, uh, and so you know, putting ideas like Hubble and Weasel, Neocognitron, uh, say SQL pattern recognition, signal processing together with, uh, with backprop is you know, basically what, what led to it. And surely, you know, there's discussions about like who invented backprop. Uh, the basic principle of backprop, you know, goes back to the early 60s uh, from optimal control. Uh, these people had the mathematics of it. They didn't have the idea that you could use this for learning. That came, that didn't come until the, the, the mid 80s, basically with the work of, you know, Dave Ramalhart and Jeff Hinton and, uh, you know, me and others. But, uh, but that's, um, that's the, you know, that, that's the history of it. Ah, yeah, that's an amazing story. So how long did you try to, uh, how long did it take you to try to make the combinats? Uh, so uh, so the, the idea was pretty clear along, you know, a long time. So while I was doing my PhD, you know, around 1985, it was pretty obvious what, or 1986, what need to be built. It was, it had to be like a, a multi-layer locally connected network, you know, possibly with shared weights, which, you know, the concept, the, you know, the concept hadn't been really kind of invented yet. Um, and, and all of this trained with backprop. And uh, I had worked with models like this that were using binary neurons and were not using backprop. They were using something uh, that we now call tension prop or, or similar to that. This was be before backprop emerged. And so the, the architecture was already there, really. Um, it's just that you know, I needed to be able to implement the, this, the system so I could train it with backprop. And I knew that this was going to be difficult from the practical point of view. So what I did was. Uh, I got together with uh, Leon Boutou, who was finishing his uh, undergraduate studies at the time. And we wrote, uh, we spent a lot of time writing a neural net simulator from scratch. Uh, and, you know, at the time there was no Python, there was no, you know, MATLAB, there was nothing like that. You had to write your own language, basically, to be able to do this. So we kind of wrote our own Lisp interpreter and, you know, our own entire thing. And it took me a year. I spent the first half of my postdoc um, with Jeff just working on this and he was wondering what I was doing in his lab because I was just writing software. Um, but then once we had this tool, it gave us superpowers. We, we were the only people who could implement convolutional nets. We are the only people who had a neural net simulator with shared weight that was general enough. It had, you know, graphic uh, visualization. So we could like figure out how to make those things work and, you know, figure out all the tricks that, you know, that we know now that make those things work. Like, you know, uh, how do you tune the learning rate? You know, what sigmoids do you use? Uh, we didn't have the idea of ReLU yet, uh, or you know things like that. How do you initialize the weights? You know, a lot of that comes from 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 that time. And um, so I started experimenting with this at the end of uh, my postdoc around uh, 1988, and then I joined Bell Labs, and they had a data set of uh, handwritten uh, digits from Z codes, and I just basically turned the crank on that data set and beat whatever. Uh, results they they had, they had that everybody had on this data set. Um, data sets were really hard to come by at the time. Um, it was very, very difficult to just collect images. You know, there was no cameras. I mean, to buy like a card to put in the computer to collect images was really complicated. Um, so that's, you know, that's how it happened. But building the right tools gives you superpowers. That, that's how you can do things uh, before others. Well, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for sharing the amazing story. And yeah, that's also why I guess it's great to see all the Frameworks, TensorFlow, PyTorch, all these frameworks are being developed and open source really help uh, further democratize uh, AI in a sense that uh, everybody gets to benefit from these tools. Um, so now, Yushua, let's, uh, uh, let's hear about your story. Could you share your story of your early days contributions and motivations from your networks? Sure. So I already mentioned that um... I, I was interested in understanding the principles of, of learning. And when I started reading these neural net papers, uh, eventually from, from, from Jan as well, 
um, I, I got very excited. I started implementing them and, um, and I started playing with sequences. So the, one of the, you know, I worked on speech recognition during my PhD. And so I, I, I guess I was one of the first playing with recurrent nets, trying to, to train recurrent nets on a fairly large scale for the day. Um, and um, it led me to uh, discover new ways of combining different kinds of uh, neural nets, so uh, multi-layer perceptrons with recurrent, uh, with probabilistic graphical models like HMMs uh, in a way that's trained end to end, which is kind of novel. And by the way, this is how I got to know Leon Boutou that Jan talked about, uh, who was working on very similar ideas also for speech recognition while he was doing his PhD in France at about the same time. Um, and then um, uh, after, after graduating, uh, as I was playing with those recurrent nets during my postdoc at MIT and then, and then with, with, uh, at Bell Labs with Jan and, and Leon, um, I tried to understand why those recurrent nets were hard to train when considering longer sequences. So after playing with them for a while, I realized that there was this problem of long-term dependencies and vanishing gradients and exploding gradients. And I wrote about this and um, it, it, it's, it's something that has had a, a lot of impact in the field. Uh, for many years, people thought, well, because of these fundamental problems that, that we discovered and, and others, I guess, in, in, in parallel, uh, uh, Jürgen uh, Schmidhuber and, um, um, and, and his uh, uh, students, uh, Hoschreiter, um, that has led to kind of uh, uh, people leaving recurrent nets away, unfortunately. Um, and the, Good news is uh, this open problem, I think, is uh, after more than two decades of working on it, I think is we're starting to approach a solution to this. So I don't want to talk too much about the, the present because you asked me about the past, but, but there are really interesting connections between the things that uh, Jan and I did in the early 90s, early 80s and, and 90s, and the, some of the problems that people are looking at now. Great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so also, as I understand, Joshua, you worked in Yang's lab before starting your career in Montreal. Any memorable stories that you two could share? Um, I remember that uh, we had uh, coffee breaks where we were playing Go, and in particular with Patrice Simard, who uh, was a very strong player compared to me. Um, and for me, it was the first time I was in, in that kind of... Uh, large enough research group with peers who had sort of similar ways of thinking and mutually uh, stimulating each other while keeping our freedom. Um, and it became a model for the way that I then conducted my lab later as a professor. So this, this has been an amazing experience for me working in this group. Yeah, I, I met Joshua when he was still a master's student. I gave a talk in Montreal uh, just when I was starting my postdoc in Toronto, and I was invited by his advisor to give a talk in Montreal. And, you know, he was a kid in the audience, and he asked some, like, very interesting questions about, like, you know, could you use this for, like, temporal signals? Obviously, he had, you know, it started working on this. Um, so that's how we met, and uh, we kind of, you know, never left each other's company very far since, uh, since then. Uh, but, you know, Joshua, together with, uh, independently with, with Leon, not completely independently, but somewhat independently with Leon and a few other people like Harry Borla and, and others, uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s, basically invented the whole concept of structured prediction with neural nets. So they were interested in speech recognition where you, you use the a neural net as an acoustic model and then you plug a hidden Markov model or something, you know, some sort of, uh, 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 structural prediction system. It wasn't called that way then, but that's, that's what it was. And then you have this uh, problem of, uh, you know, basically you have latent variables in the system. You're like, you know, you do Viterbi algorithm to find the best interpretation. How do you train a system like this in a kind of supervised discriminative manner? And Yoshua kind of basically had a proposal end to end. in his- uh, huh? end, end to end, end, right? end, to end as, as you coined it. Right. And so, was, you know, structural prediction for sequence and sequences. And, and Yoshua had a, uh, had a proposal in his, in his PhD about this, and uh, Leon Botou, who credited about the same time, also had a proposal, but he also had a point in his PhD, which, which was that 
if you use probabilistic models, there's a bit of a over constraining, you know, the, the problem is over constrained if you use kind of normalized probabilities in your HMM. And at the time I was, you know, struggling with the idea of doing continuous uh, handwriting recognition. And, and I figured these guys have the answer. So, you know, I did everything I can to bring them both at Bell Labs so we could, you know, just crack the problem. Uh, a third, you know, a, a third person working on this was also Patrick Hafner, who kind of joined a little later. And between the four of us, we kind of, you know, uh, sort of figured it out a little bit, like, you know, how you do end-to-end uh, -end contrastive uh, uh, supervised learning uh, for, you know, where you have neural nets and structure prediction on top of it. Um, and Which then sort of people kind of output interpret space. This. Just for people who don't know, no, like it means the output space is exponentially large. You can't enumerate all the answers. Right. So you have a combinatorial, a combinatorial set of possible outputs. You don't have like, you know, a thousand categories. You have a whole sentence and which can be generated by kind of combinatorial, you know, combining words and or characters or phonemes or whatever it is that, that you're interested in. So I thought, you know, this was the thing I was the most proud of. You know, I thought conventional nets com compared to this was simple. And and you know, Yosha and I like and, and Leon published a couple of papers in 1995 about this, and then 1997, 1998, which is our most cited paper actually. Um, but uh, back then, nobody paid attention; nobody was interested in this, um, and and that was a big kind of disappointment for me because I thought this was the future of uh, of machine learning, and uh, nobody nobody really picked up on it until fairly recently. Yeah, I, I guess that's what people say. Uh, great things often take time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing your um, your stories and your lessons from the past. So now let's uh, come uh, back to uh, the present day and talk a little bit about the current work. So here's a question that we ask all our guests. So could you again share with us a key message from your talk? that you'd like everyone to remember going forward into their work. Go ahead, Sorry, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, okay, my message is, uh, is in the title actually that the, the future of machine learning is in uh, self-supervised learning or at least a diminishing uh, role of supervised learning and reinforcement learning. Uh, uh, most of what we learn as humans and most of what animals learn is learned neither in supervised mode nor in reinforcement mode. Uh, it's learned basically by just basically observing the world, interacting with it a little bit, but mostly just by observation in a task independent way. This is the type of learning that we don't know how to reproduce with machines. And if we ever want machines to approach animal and human intelligence, uh, this is what sh we should be working on. There is already very promising results, obviously in natural language processing, it's you know self-supervised pre-training has become dominant now with uh, models like BERT. Um, it's not quite the case in, uh, uh, in vision yet, although there are early results now that are, that are coming. So that's, that's one thing. The second thing is uh, the main problem with self-supervised learning is, is that you're training a machine to do things like predicting the future in a video or something like that. And the, the main issue there is to deal with uncertainty. And the, the only way we, we know to deal with uncertainty is to represent a distribution. The problem is that in high dimensional continuous spaces, we don't know how to represent distributions in a useful way. Uh, we know how to do this in discrete space, which is why BERT works so well, but we don't know how to do it in continuous spaces, which is why we don't know how to do self-supervised learning in vision very well. Um, so we have to attack this problem. And I think we have to basically abandon the idea that we're gonna model the density in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the space that we're trying to make predictions in. And it's a little bit similar to this 1998 paper that I, I mentioned that, that Joshua, Leon, Patrick Hafner, and I wrote, uh, uh, where we said a bit the same thing. We said, like, you know, you want to do classification, just optimize a criterion that does the right thing. And, you know, if it's not probabilistic, so be it. And in the end, you have to make a decision anyway. Um, so it's a little bit the same idea. So I'm proposing this idea of energy based models, which, of course, I didn't invent. There's a lot of energy based models going back to Boston machines and even probably before that. Um, but, but that's, you know, kind of a way of, uh, but basically I'm kind of telling people to abandon the idea that you necessarily have to do maximum likelihood to train those things. Um, and then the last message, which is really not supported at all in the, in the talk, uh, is that we should stop talking about AGI. AGI does not exist. There is no such thing as general intelligence. Human intelligence is very specialized. And so if we should talk about something, it would be, uh, you know, 
rat level intelligence, cat level intelligence, dog level intelligence, or human level intelligence, but not artificial general, general intelligence. That just does not exist. I agree. And if I could uh, maybe summarize a few of the key messages from my talk uh, and maybe answer some of the questions I've seen in the rocket chat. Um, so some people ask that, like, what is it after deep learning? Um, and I would say it's uh, you know extended deep learning, if we want, deep learning 2.0, whatever. Um, deep learning has been extremely successful at capturing the kind of dependencies that exist in perceptual data, uh, like images and sounds, as well as, um, you know, to some extent, low level actions, which reinforcement learning allows us to do with deep reinforcement learning. Um, but we're still um, uh, far from the kind of abilities that humans show in terms of reasoning, as Jan was talking about earlier, in terms of uh, the uh, system two tasks that Kahneman has been talking about in his book. And um, I've, I've been pushing the idea that we are now in a position to really make progress on these problems, thanks to what has been achieved with attention mechanisms, which is something that's uh, one of the important contributions that I've made a few years ago, and I think uh, is at the heart of a complete change in perspective in what neural nets mean. Uh, attention allows us to go from vector processing to set processing. And uh, attention allows us to, instead of processing everything in one block uh, and uh, combine a lot of pieces of information in one go, as neural nets are really good at, uh, focus on a few elements at a time in order to do things like reasoning and planning. And this is something humans use. And one of the big questions that I've been trying to address is why would that be useful? Like, why would you want to have this bottleneck uh, in, in, in processing? And, it, and um, I want to make also the connection with all the work that's been done in cognitive neuroscience about consciousness and conscious processing, because we now understand better by looking at uh, images of what's going on in the brain, uh, what's the difference between when we um, think in a conscious way or when we come up with a decision without requiring a lot of uh, conscious processing. And, and there are different ways of processing information. So right now we, we, we understand reasonably well how the brain might be doing things like, like vision at, at, at up to a certain level. And then I think one of the big questions is how does that connect to the understanding of higher level uh, semantic variables, the kind of uh, variables that we communicate with language. Um, so I think there's a, a lot of progress that could be achieved by bringing together things like grounded language learning, where we're jointly trying to understand a model of the world, which Jan talks a lot about, um, and the higher level concepts that correspond, if you want, to the names of things. And, and uh, But how these high level concepts are related to each other, uh, what is the kind of joint distribution you have at the top? And how does this distribution change with time? So one of the biggest questions, biggest challenges in machine learning right now is how do we deal with um, changes in distribution, uh, out of distribution generalization, transfer learning? We don't have good ways of doing this. And I believe that uh, human conscious processing is exploiting assumptions about how the world may change, which um, can be conveniently implemented at this high level of representation. Essentially, my claim is that we are assuming, it's not just my claim, it's what people in causality have been saying for a long time, that those changes can be explained by uh, interventions. In other words, a few things at the abstract level are typically the explanation for what is changing. And this is what we can see by ourselves because we come up with a sentence that explains the change. So anyways, I'm not going to give the whole talk, but the, I think uh, the themes of uh, understanding how we manipulate high-level concepts, how we represent their capture, their distribution, how those distributions change over time, how this is related to agency and causality, uh, and out of distribution generalization are, I think, all highly connected and uh, could create a new generation of deep learning uh, models. Great, great. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Yang and Yushua, for, uh, for summarizing your talk. So Yang, uh, going back to your talk, uh, as you just summarized, uh, you, uh, you mentioned that uh, you think uh, human learning is mostly uh, self-supervised with a little bit of supervision and RL. 
And also you previously described the RL as the cherry on top. So do you think that we will soon see self-supervised systems that can learn to solve common RL tasks, such as Atari or Mojuko? Uh, you think uh, that we are still missing some fundamental insights to make that a reality? Well, I think, um, I, I don't think we're, we're missing major concepts other than uh, at least not in the context of things like Mujoko, uh, where basically it's a deterministic world. Uh, so there's a frustrating thing, which is that uh, model-based methods for such applications don't work as well as uh, asymptotically as model-free methods. Uh, model-free methods are extremely slow. They require many, many, many interactions with the uh, with the uh, environment to reach any kind of decent level of performance. Um, uh, but what we'd like is uh, reinforcement learning algorithms that would allow, uh, you know, uh, uh, autonomous driving system, for example, to uh, learn to drive in about 30 hours the way humans do it uh, without crashing uh, or destroying thousands of cars. And right now we just don't have those techniques. So what is it that allows humans to uh, learn to drive a car in 30 hours. Of course, the obvious answer to this is all the background knowledge we have about how the world works, right? We have some good physical model of uh, how a car behaves, uh, even if it's only approximate initially. We, uh, we know that if we, the example I use all the time is that we know that if we drive next to a cliff and we turn the wheel to the right, the car will veer off, veer off the cliff and crash at the bottom and we get killed. Um, a, a, a basic model-free RL system does not know this. It has to crash in, it has to turn the wheel to the right and crash into the uh, uh, into the into the ravine several thousand times before it figures out how that's a it's a bad thing, and then you know figure out how not to do it. So, um, so obviously we need to be able to learn models of the world, and Joshua just mentioned this, and uh, and that's the whole reason the raison d'être, if you want, for self-supervised learning, learning models of the world. It's not just learning features for vision or something; it's learning predictive models of the world that would allow learning systems to kind of uh, learn without killing themselves and learn really quickly by using the representation of the world that are uh, accessible to it through this uh, self-supervised learning. So um, that's the, you know, the, the, the component we're missing. Uh, conceptually, I think it's fairly simple, except that in uncertain environments where we cannot predict entirely everything else, you know, you are driving on the road and the cars around you are not completely predictable. Um, and so, you, you have to have predictive models of the world that can handle the uncertainty. And we're back to the problem I was mentioning before. How do you handle uncertainty in high dimensional continuous spaces? We haven't solved that problem. That's the problem we should be working on. That's what I'm working on. I think everybody should be working on this. Not everyone, because there's a lot of applications to work on that don't require this. But, uh, but if you're really interested in sort of pushing the envelope of, uh, uh, you know, of AI, um, that's, in my opinion, that's really one of the biggest obstacles. There are others like, you know, Yasha mentioned causality. So causality would be a tool to basically allow self-supervised learning system to learn more about the world uh, than by just kind of, you know, observing data. But uh, uh, but the two are connected. So I, I, just, saw this, I, agree. I, I, I just saw this video of uh, new Caledonian crows, uh, which are doing like zero shot generalization in a setup, which they have for sure never seen in their life. And they, they somehow understand the physics of what's going on and they are able to find what is the right strategy uh, from the first time they try, right? So they clearly, they don't have enough, uh, they don't have any experience with any setting in nature close to that, but they understand the physics of things somehow, then the causal effect of their actions on, on the world. And they, they seem to be able to plan with that internal model and do the right thing right in, you know, on the first trial. And that's that's pretty amazing. And this is the kind of thing we need to have in, in, in our deep learning systems as well. And their brain has less than, a, less than a billion neurons, right? That's kind of amazing, isn't it? I mean, you can do a lot. <laughs> Great, yeah, thank you. Um, so Joshua, in your talk, you talk about system one and system two. And here's a question from uh, Rocky Chat uh, by Daniel Ginson. Uh, he's not here. Uh, so I'm reading out the question. So how do you see existing knowledge base and graph uh, and knowledge graphs integrated with your view of AI systems? These knowledge bases uh, could serve as strong priors for causal and other relations between objects in the world. But how should we use these together with neural models effectively? 
Yeah, so this is connected to what I was talking about earlier when I said that the high level concepts that we would like our deep learning systems to, um, uh, to map low level data to and to represent the joint distribution of these high level concepts, I, I call them sometimes semantic concepts because they should be close in some way to uh, concept the way we express uh, uh, things like words and sentences and phrases. And so um, I think there is a big advantage for humans, for example, or with respect to other animals that they can acquire all kinds of knowledge about the world without having to experience it thanks to culture. And so uh, as we build intelligent machines, the, I believe the same thing will happen that yes, they can, they can discover all kinds of things in their environment, like think of like a, a robot or a baby. Um, but at some point they might also learn about the, the sort of uh, uh, verbalizable knowledge that system two, which we currently have in, in text or in these uh, semantic data sets and, and databases and, and ontologies and, and, and so on. So right now it's not completely clear how to make that juncture, but the, the basic hypothesis is that um, we could learn jointly the mapping from low level perceptual data to these high level representations, as well as how these high level representations through a, a fairly simple transformation uh, give rise to uh, verbalizable uh, statements like what you find in sentences or in these databases that he's talking about. Great, great. Yeah, thanks. Thanks a lot. So now let's um, look into the future and uh, um, talk about future directions. So first, uh, Yang and Yoshua, so what do you think about the balance between empirical and theoretical research in the deep learning community currently? Do you think it is possible to bring deeper theoretical understanding to deep learning? And if yes, what do you think what's needed to make progress in this space? Yeah, this is a, an issue that I'm really interested in uh, because I'm somehow viewed by some people as, as, as being the extreme empiricist, but it's not true. I've been, uh, I've been working a lot to actually uh, uh, get the, the, the community of theoreticians interested in deep learning for many years for uh, you know over a decade and a half, organizing workshops at IPAM, for example, and things like this, getting the uh, applied math community, for example, interested, uh, uh, you know, theoretical computer science, uh, of course, as well as physicists, because theoretical physicists brought a lot to the table back in the uh, late 80s, I mean, mid 80s, actually, uh, to the, the sort of understanding of certain types of neural nets. And I thought, you know, the techniques that come from uh, condensed matter uh, physics and, uh, you know, statistical physics in particular are very useful to understand. I mean, the math is basically the same as uh, sort of, you know, Bayesian uh, inference. In fact, a lot of the math in sort of Bayesian inference is borrowed from statistical physics. So uh, I always thought that bringing these people together will sort of help us understand really uh, a lot more about the, the theory. So um, there's, uh, there's something about theory that uh, I gave a talk at uh, the IAS in Princeton a few months ago about, about this, about the uh, epistemology of deep learning, if you want. Um, uh, empirical methods are useful. They're not sufficient. Um, and certainly, uh, uh, theory is 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 very useful in the sense that it limits the, uh, the 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 type of thing you will do that because it will tell you what's impossible, right? Um, but what you what you have to be careful about is not to be hypnotized by by cute math, first of all, and not to feel limited uh, uh, in terms of the techniques you use just because you don't understand them theoretically. So I think one disease that the community has been, uh, you know, had fallen victim of in the late 90s and early 2000s is that just because the theory of neural net uh, was, not, was not there, people decided that it, they didn't work. And that's just wrong. Heuristically, it's, it's completely wrong. The, when there is empirical evidence that something works, uh, there's no theory that will, you know, when the theory disagrees with the experiment, it's, it's the theory that's wrong or the hypothesis that are wrong. It's not the world that is wrong, right? Um, so, um, so, so you have to uh, be a real scientist, which means you know, take empirical evidence into account and not dismiss it uh, too easily, uh, uh, as well as then you know, try to use theory to kind of explain what, what goes on. So I'm really happy with what's going on at the moment, actually, in the, uh, the theoretical understanding of like, why is it that vastly over-parameterized neural nets 
uh, seemed to ger generalize, okay? Um, that was really not very well understood. It was known, but it was not understood until very recently. It, it's still not completely understood, but there is some more evidence now. You know, how is it that despite the fact that the objective functions we're minimizing are extremely non-convex, that we never seem to hit too many local minima problems. Um, and again, that's kind of starting to get understood, but, uh, but people kind of got hung up on, on, uh, on, 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 you know, on theory that, that, that wasn't there to show that it worked and then decided that those techniques could not possibly work. That was wrong. So I completely agree with everything Jan said, as, as usual. Um, I will add a, um, a, a, an element to his arguments about constraints. So you can think of uh, experimental results as giving constraints about truth, and theory can give us constraints about truth. Um, now, in the experimental results, usually we think mostly of the results of our machine learning experiments. But there's also the experimental results coming from observing natural intelligence. So neuroscience, psychology, uh, cognitive neuroscience, and so on. Uh, they actually give us a lot of clues, um, both in their theories, which are not always correct, but, but in their experiments, which are what they are, uh, about potential solutions. I mean, solutions that presumably evolution has discovered. And I think um, it's, it's it, for me. It's been a guiding principle uh, since the beginning of uh, you know my graduate studies, and an inspiration and a motivation to understand how brains work. And I think it's it's a way to um, add a, a third constraint on the way we're thinking about problems that currently in the machine learning community most people are ignoring because well it's not convenient. You have all of this literature and it's another field. But, but really, for me, it's been uh, one of the big sources of inspiration that, ha that has been like a secret sauce for a lot of the success that I've had in, in my career. Great. Uh, thank you. So the next question comes from uh, Rocket Chats and from uh, Daniel Hendricks. And he is with us uh, in the session. So I'll have him ask his question. Um, thank you. The two of you had a notable Facebook conversation on aligning AI with human values. Yashua concluded that conversation by saying, quote, as we build more and more powerful, intelligent tools and organizations, one, it becomes easier to cheat for smarter agents, which can exploit the misalignment, and two, the cost of these misalignments becomes greater, potentially threatening the whole of society. This then does not leave much time and warning to react to value misalignment, end quote. What are your views on Yashua's concerns, Jan? And where do each of you stand on the problem of value misalignment today? Yeah, I mean, this is a really complex issue that uh, you know a lot of people have written about. I mean, this discussion, which uh, took place on Facebook, actually, was was really interesting. It was you know got to the core of uh, uh, you know we got people to sort of express their position about various things, including me and Joshua and uh, Stuart Russell and and various other people. Um, so it, here is the thing: um, there's been a lot uh, said about. Uh, uh, how difficult it is uh, to design an objective function that implements, you know, some sort of values that the system cannot exploit by by cheating, essentially. Okay. Now, this is a problem that humanity has been extremely familiar with for for centuries, or if not millennia. Uh, the way society is organized is that uh, there are, you know, rules and laws and things like that, and and those are basically terms in an objective function to, uh, in you know incentivize people to do the right thing for the common good. They're not always well designed and they have to be fixed and they evolve constantly. But that's basically what designing laws is about. It's, uh, uh, it's designing uh, objective functions for people, right? So uh, we are somewhat familiar with the concept, uh, you know, for millennia. Why would we not be able to do this for machines that are much easier to control than humans because we design them, we build them, we design them. Uh, so. And then there is, you know, uh, all kinds of procedures we can follow to kind of make sure that things that are uh, deployed widely are safe before they're being deployed. And because, you know, we can have, uh, 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 you know, like, like play pens and, 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 and things like that. So, um, so I think the issue uh, is not as dire as what a lot of people have, uh, um, have expressed it. Um, but on the other hand, so, so, you know, that, that kind of uh, makes, you know, uh, 
catastrophe science fiction scenarios where you know uh, uh, some AI system is you know given incredible power and all of, and all of a sudden takes over. Uh, you know that's just a, that's just Hollywood scenario. Um, uh, in reality, I don't think things uh, will, will go this way. That said, it's a it's a difficult issue, but it's not something that we are completely unfamiliar with. Um, it, you know, it's been around for a long time. Now. The, the question of how to design laws to in, incentivize people to do the right thing, you know, it, it, it becomes politics now, right? It, it becomes like, um, what is your set of values? How do we, uh, you know, align values of one group with another, uh, where one group could be uh, machines of a certain type, uh, et cetera. So, um, you know, I think we have to kind of, uh, uh, those are sort of interesting intellectual debates. Right now, they are kind of, uh, at least in their more dire form, they are sort of a little abstract in the sense that you know we, we have no idea how to build like really intelligent machines at the moment. But but it is the case that uh, currently um, uh, AI-like systems or machine learning systems are optimizing objective functions that do have an impact on society. For example, in social networks, right? So you know Facebook, YouTube, etc., Twitter, um, those things actually have an impact on society, and it's very important to think about those. I mean, to do more than think about those, to like work on those really hard. So I agree with that last point for sure. Uh, I think value alignment is something we need to understand better and do more research on. On the other hand, um, I agree with Jan that um, and maybe you know, I'm not on the catastrophic uh, side of things uh, that current projections of the power of the machines we're building uh, you know, don't let us believe that in the next few years or even decade or more, uh, we'll have machines that, uh, uh, for which this is going to be a big issue. Uh, it might. And so there's uncertainty. And, and so certainly we should investigate those things. What I'm more concerned about in terms of the value alignment, and again, connecting to what Jan said, is the value alignment in, um, in our societies, uh, in how uh, agents in society which... Uh, are like AIs in the sense that they have uh, a lot of intelligence through a lot of people working together, like in, in a company, for example, or a government, can act in a way that's not aligned with the common good. And I think this, it's really interesting because these kinds of questions you know, bring us way uh, far from our usual thinking in machine learning and you know, bring us in game theory, bring us in sociology, bring us in uh, all kinds of uh, difficult uh, areas. But uh, I believe there are fruitful connections to be made, and it becomes even more important when you think about the social impact of AI. Um, is I'm right now, I'm more concerned about the technology we have being abused by uh, people who use it to acquire more power than by machines taking over humans. Uh, nonetheless, the, some of the technical problems are similar, and I think it's really worthwhile uh, continuing that investigation. Great. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks, Yang and Joshua, for sharing your uh, experience and views of deep learning in the past, current, and the future directions. So now in the remaining time, we also want to take the opportunity to hear your advice to researchers and students in the field. So first, what is one of the most often overlooked things in machine learning that you wish the more people would know about? Well, I've already said that I thought that uh, for myself, uh, I thought more people could benefit from understanding what our colleagues in neuroscience and psychology are doing to understand human intelligence and animal intelligence. This has been one of the driving forces behind neural net research from the beginning, but it's it's been somewhat uh, you know left as something fairly marginal in our community, and and I think we we would we could gain a lot by going back to those roots. Yeah, this is not something that's too overlooked. I'm going to say, but uh, but I'm sort of kind of repeating this message. Uh, we're not going to get anywhere close to human level intelligence by just getting up supervised running and reinforcement running. Uh, you know, some people believe that it will. I, I just think it's hopeless. Yeah, agreed. Um, okay, uh, so we all know about the archive insanity. Uh, about 100 papers in machine learning are posted on archive every day. 
So we have some questions from uh, the audience on Rocket Chat about this. Uh, so Tejas Sui uh, is uh, also in the session. So I've unmuted you. Would you like to ask your question? Uh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, so I asked this question in Rocket Chat. It was, how do you both stay updated on current research? And what suggestions would you give to others to be able to do the same? I think I did get an answer from uh, Yoshua Benjio that he tries but to. Maybe, yeah, so maybe Yoshua and Yang can yeah. uh, give. <laughs> yeah, sure. I said that I wrote that uh, I, I, I'm not updated on current research because there's too much. So don't know, don't give yourself a goal that's not achievable, but do your best and take advantage of your social network. I, I you know, you, you collaborate with people, uh, you talk with them, you take advantage of uh, internet social networks in order to um, get clues about what are important things to read in your field. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah, I agree with this. Uh, same thing. I can't. I can't follow everything. So I've just given up on a lot of topics. That you know, I don't go into the details. I try to get the gist of it, just to not get blindsided. But um, uh, there's a lot of things that I used to be really sort of uh, an expert at, and that I'm not anymore because I kind of given up on it. So you have to choose your battles. You have to choose what you want to be interested in, what you think is important, and just kind of focus on that. Um, and not completely ignoring the rest, uh, kind of educating yourself. And as Joshua said, you have to use your, uh, your immediate uh, uh, surrounding, your colleagues. It's easier for people in Joshua's position and mine because we have lots of very talented uh, you know, colleagues that we can go to and students, we can go to them, ask them to explain to us a paper um, without has, us having to read it. Uh, that's, that's one thing. But, uh, but second thing also is uh, social networks. I think, um, you know, I, I use a combination of Facebook and Twitter and it, it gives me a heads up on a lot of papers that I would otherwise uh, uh, have ignored. And uh, that's, um, I think it's, uh, it's a very useful tool uh, these days. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so thinking back on your early career, what non-technical things did you learn that you think was most critical for your long-term success as a researcher? And what would you have wished to know then that you know now? Um, I think, uh, I mean, a lot of things I, I learned, you know, in, in a field like, like ours, which is basically engineering science, right? I mean, we, it's a combination of, of scientific methods, but also uh, engineering creativity, if you want. And the engineering creativity part, I learned with my dad by, you know, building model airplanes uh, to, uh, you know, building uh, electronic music instruments when I was a teenager and things like that, right? So it gives you the, the sort of the, the knack for, for kind of uh, imagining something that doesn't exist, trying to figure out if it's gonna work before it works and then trying it out and then, you know, figuring out how to make things work. And I got interested in computers pretty early, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little too old. So there were no personal computers when I was uh, uh, still in high school. Um, so I think that that's a lot of, you know, it's non-technical in the sense that, uh, yeah, I played music as well, but you know, it's non-technical in the sense that it gives you an idea of how you create things uh, and, 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 and how you kind of make it work and connect it with, with reality. And then, uh, and then you have to learn the science and the techniques that are kind of uh, underlying all this. So what I'd like to mention is uh, relational skills. When I was uh, a young student and grad student, um, I was very, very poor at relational skills. I was a, a nerd, if you want, and like many of us today still. Um, but it turns out that to have a successful research career, uh, you can't do it alone. You, you do it with others. And uh, learning how to have productive interactions, uh, emotionally rewarding interactions is something I didn't pay too much attention in, in, at the beginning of my career that I, I wished I had uh, uh, focused a bit more on when I was in my twenties, for sure. And now I know it's super important. Yeah, I agree with that. I was also a nerd, you know, not pretty, not particularly good at human uh, connection. So uh, it's something you you can learn. Uh, 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 something else I learned is that, uh, which I think is very useful, is that um, the you you have to you have to explain your ideas. You don't have to kind of 
there is a tendency, particularly if people coming from certain cultures, like for example, in some parts of Europe, where you know, as a scientist, what you have to do is impress your peers. Uh, you know, by doing complicated math or doing something like this. And what I discovered coming to the US is that it's the opposite. You have to kind of simplify everything that, uh, that you do to make it, uh, uh, to kind of come to the core of it and, and then explain it in ways that everybody can understand. Because that's the only way an idea is going to uh, get disseminated. Uh, you think ideas, good ideas get disseminated automatically but it's not true. You have to ram it down people's throat, essentially. I mean, I'm using a bad image here, but, uh, but, uh, but essentially, you know, people have limited bandwidth, they have limited uh, time, and to kind of bring an idea to their attention is, is, not, is not easy, uh, even if it's a good idea. And I failed at it, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing uh, this really valuable uh, advice and uh, experience. So the next question comes from Rocky Chats by Lois Liu. Uh, he's not here, so I'll read out the question. This is a three-part question. Uh, part one is, what would be the top three things you would like to say to people aiming to excel in this area? Um, take a, a problem that you know is important for the long term. So there are there's a lot of things you can work on which will get you uh, you know, will will make a product more useful or more, you know, a better performance in the short term, or something that will get you a paper in the next NIPS, uh, or or, or NURIPS, I'm sorry, or a clear or whatever, um, or you know, things like this. But there, but there's a question I think which uh, has driven me, which is, uh, what is it that people will be doing like five, ten years from now? That you know, what are the important problems that you need to solve to get there? Like, you know, have kind of a view on the the long-term horizon and try to work towards it. Uh, and there are solutions, there are things to, to work on that you quickly realize are kind of distractions. They're kind of you know, side uh, branches, which will get you a paper at the next conference, but you know, nobody, will, nobody will talk about it in two years. Uh, whereas the things that are kind of on a path towards some kind of long-term big impacting, there are things that may have a, long, a longer uh, shelf time. Um, on the other hand, they may, it may be more difficult to get those papers accepted anywhere because, and so you may only be able to do this if you work in certain institutions where it doesn't matter as much, or maybe you're senior enough that it doesn't matter as much. But, uh, but that's something that's kind of, uh, uh, you know, dri driven me uh, quite a bit. And then for younger uh, people, like, you know, undergraduate students, uh, can I learn basic mathematical techniques that come out of different fields? So things like, um, I find that a lot of things that I, I learned uh, by studying quantum mechanics turns out to be extremely useful. There's a lot of concepts that come out of this that you get familiar with and that they help you understand a lot of things. You would not think that quantum mechanics has anything to do with machine learning, but it does. It has things like, I don't know, path integrals. It's the same as a uh, forward algorithm in a graphical model. It's the same thing. Um, I mean, th there's a lot of concepts like this that uh, I think uh, people need to learn uh, early on. I'd like to add uh, something about intuition and self-confidence. I see a lot of uh, very smart young people who could do a great research career if only they had more confidence in themselves and their ideas. And of course, there are people who have overconfidence and that's not going to work in science either. So you have to strike the right uh, uh, balance. But uh, for this to work, especially for the underconfident people, they have to listen to their own intuitions. Uh, sometimes we get thoughts that, you know, come to us and sometimes these could be ideas. Um, if we just let them go, we, we may lose on a, an opportunity. Uh, and the, the, these starting points, these uh, intuitions, they're not enough by themselves. You, you have to dig, you have to reason, you have to do experiments and many of them don't work. But all of the important ideas I had, you know, came like this. And so you, you have to be listening to that and and then willing to believe in yourself enough to try to convince other people try to uh formalize these ideas try to do experiments to validate them uh, you have to invest in those and one thing that has worked for me is you you become for a while emotionally attached to these ideas and that allows you to to um Continue even if others, other people will think, oh, and say that your idea is not good. 
uh, you should only focus on, on reason. Like, what are the facts? Um, why do I think this may be interesting? And, and then not just be uh, uh, inhibited by, by uh, simply the emotional aspect of, of people saying that your work is not good or, or your idea is not good, but, but just try to go to the actual content. Oh, great. Yeah, thank you. And part two is, how do you handle your ups and downs? Another way to put it is, how do you handle your failures uh, in this field? So this is actually very much related to what I just discussed, right? Uh, you have to build confidence in your intuitions. And, you know, if, even if the rest of the world doesn't believe what you're proposing, which has been a little bit of what Jan and I went through, uh, if you if you have strong evidence, um, you should pursue it. This is how um, uh, really out of the box thinking can eventually be shown to work. Now, of course, not everyone's crazy idea is going to become a success, but we need many people to explore these wild goose chases for some of them to turn out uh, really important results. And so, in in a society where we reward research, we should reward diversity exploration and and not simply all be doing the same thing yeah i i uh i concur with that um i mean i you know yoshua and i are at a point in our career where it doesn't matter anymore uh, a failure it matters a lot more to people working with us like students and stuff so you know uh you work on an idea you submit a paper the paper is rejected uh it's much more of a disaster for the for the student than it is for 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 us um so I think we're past that stage, um, but uh, you know I have to tell you. So going back to the the mid '90s, uh, you know after kind of the, the the work we did on on handwriting recognition and check reading, and there was commercial success for it at AT and T and everything. The the stuff that Yosha and I worked on, and Neil Batu and Patrick Hafner, and and the cast of other people, many engineers at, at AT and T worked on this as well. Um, we um, uh, you know we realized that there was no interest from the community in those in those techniques anymore uh, and um, I was simultaneously promoted to um, uh, being a, a department head and I stopped working on machine learning for about five years completely um, the paper from 1997 1998 that we wrote were on work that we did before 1996 um, I, I worked on image compression with Leon Yoshua also participated actually although he was back in Montreal uh, but I basically stopped working on machine learning for about five years. I stopped going to, to NIPS. Um, you know, a couple, I missed a few. I mean, I still went there because, you know, there were friends and interesting stuff, but, um, uh, but it, was, it was less interesting to me. So I started working on something else that I thought would have a bigger impact. This was the early days of the internet. And I thought um, uh, being able to bring all the knowledge that was, uh, uh, you know, at the time on paper to the, the digital world would be, uh, it almost beneficial to society. So, uh, so we worked on this technical deja vu, which was sort of a way of uh, being able to kind of scan documents and sort of distribute them on the web. This was, you know, a deliberate choice of trying to have an impact with technology and kind of pu putting my interest in machine learning in parentheses for about five years. And then I came back to it five years later. Uh, but I left at and t before I could do this. Um, uh, thank you. And so the part three is, what is the main impact that you want to have on the world? And also let me add uh, one more part. Uh, so to you, what is uh, the meaning of life? <laughs> um, that's, a comp uh, that's a trick question. Okay, uh, I'll answer the first one. The impact I, uh, I wanna have on the world. I don't get motivated by having an impact on the world. I, I want to uh, understand intelligence. That's a scientific question. Okay. and. Others may be interested in this as well, but I think it's, it's a problem that's interesting in itself. Then there are applications of this. Of course, we can build intelligent machines, they can help society, et cetera. And I'm extremely, extremely, extremely motivated by this as well. But, uh, but I think the, 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 the main one is uh, uh, understanding ourselves better. If we understand intelligence, we understand ourselves better. We understand human nature. Uh, maybe it will make uh, humans more rational. Currently, I think one of the big problems humanity has is lack of rational thought in many uh, different instances. Uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a rationalist. And so, um, uh, you know, that's perhaps one of the big impacts I, I wanna have uh, through science and, and technology. Um, 
And of course, you know, uh, a lot of the technology we develop can be useful for all kinds of stuff that is extremely useful in, you know, healthcare and, uh, you know, energy and whatever. And I, I, I found that great um, as well. What's the meaning of life? Uh, well, um, that's an interesting question. Um, okay, I'm a very non-religious person. I'm a, I'm a sort of uh, militant atheist, you could, you could say it this way. So I don't derive uh, meaning from any kind of supernatural cause. Uh, we're, become very, we're becoming sort of very personal and philosoph philosophical here. Um, I'm kind of, um, I see the evolution of the universe as kind of going towards more complexity. And so whatever we do to increase the, the complexity of the universe, which is the environment around us, which means more understanding, more knowledge, more science, more rational thought, uh, more uh, human well-being because that's uh, an absolute necessity to be able to do this. So basically, you know, maximizing human well-being and minimizing human suffering, I think, is a good uh, value function. It's a good objective function to optimize if you optimize it uh, over the long run. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, science is a good way to uh, to do that. That's why I'm a scientist. So Jan said all the words I, I could have said. I'm not going to repeat Sorry. them. I'm completely lying. No, that's great. So I can talk about something else, which uh, is related to impact. I feel like uh, in addition to what Jan said, at the stage at which uh, we are, he and I, we also have a responsibility uh, as people who, whose society has given a, a voice to try to use this voice to steer our society in what we think are better directions. And in our case, because we are uh, experts in machine learning, that means things like how society is gonna deploy AI, uh, the social impact of AI, and how we can encourage investments in places where we think uh, the technology is gonna be used for good rather than uh, abused. So I think this is a, a, an additional impact but of course my main impact in one word uh the things that we really, i really care about both at, in terms of the meaning of life and in terms of what drives me as uh, the same as jan is understanding great great thank you thanks a lot for sharing your meaning of life <laughs> um okay yeah thanks everyone so so now in the i will take a few more minutes uh, to take questions from the audience uh, so I see a few hands uh, have raised. Uh, so if you are not uh, asking a question, please do not raise your hands. And if you raise your hands, uh, I assume that you have questions that you want to ask. Okay, so first let's go to Bennett Breer. Uh, Bennett, I unmuted you. Uh, yes. Do you have Hello. a question that you can ask? Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Wonderful. Um, so uh, my question is uh, to uh, Jan. Uh, you said you were inspired by neuroscience when inventing the Lynette. Um, how do AI and neuroscience inspire each other today and in the future? What do you think? Well, there is an interesting phenomenon that's happened in visual neuroscience in particular over the last uh, several years, uh, which is that it used to be that uh, in visual uh, uh, psychophysics, for example, the standard model of the of visual perception was essentially what amounts to template matching. Uh, and, uh, you know, people had, you know, various ideas about how the visual cortex kind of processes information. There was this idea of hierarchy and feed forward, but nobody really had a model they could use, uh, uh, you know, a sort of quantitative model they could use if you want to kind of explain the data that we're observing from uh, electrophysiology or fMRI or various other, uh, other teams. Nowadays, almost everyone in visual neuroscience uses convolutional net as a model of the visual cortex. And so this is a very interesting kind of back and forth where, you know, convolutional nets were inspired by neuroscience and then kind of developed for about 30 years. And now that they are so, that it works so well, they're now being used by neuroscientists as a model of uh, what the visual uh, system uh, does, at least the, the ventral pathway of the visual system, because convolutional nets don't really kind of model the, the, the rest. And so, uh, you know, people are thinking again about uh, uh, neural nets, kind of the engineering side of neural nets as, uh, you know, something that can be useful for, for, uh, for neuroscience, computational neuroscience in particular. And so we see more connections. Those connections existed back in the 80s and early 90s, and they kind of disappeared uh, when sort of machine learning moved away from 
uh, from neural nets basically and uh, and and now now it's coming back and I, I find that uh, fascinating and now people are talking including Joshua are talking again about like how could the brain do gradient descent does the brain minimize an objective function how could the brain the brain do gradient descent how does the brain evaluate gradients does it do backprop or something similar to this uh, and you know uh, people are asking themselves that question seriously now and it was kind of something you would not consider even uh, mentioning uh, you know ten years ago. Thank you. Yusha, do you have something that you would like no, to add to? That's good. Okay. okay, great. So let's move to the next question. And uh, so, Hamad, uh, I have unmuted you. Hamad uh, Ayub? Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, I have a question to uh, Yasha. So, thank you for your talk. And this talk uh, kind of resembles you, the talk that you gave at Neuron. <laughs> yes. Uh, and, and you talked about you know, modeling structures of concepts. Uh, you know, which is kind of similar like uh, symbols in symbolic AI into neural nets for kind of higher level order, uh, higher order human reasoning tasks. And so I wanted to ask you, how do you compare this approach against uh, Charles Sutton's bitter lesson that we shouldn't impose our view or the structure of the world on these machines, rather we should let them figure out uh, themselves uh, the world using data and compute. Um, so, I agree only to a point with that statement um, that uh, I think uh, deep learning is, is scaling in a beautiful way and it's one of its great strengths. But I also think that culture is a you know, huge reason why we are so intelligent and able to solve problems in the world. And uh, of course we have to make sufficient progress in building gradually more intelligent machines. And at some point, I think, and I think we're approaching that point, we can start asking the question, how do these say neural nets, because this is what I care about, uh, handle um, the kinds of representations that uh, is being exchanged with language through culture? And how do we manipulate that knowledge? How do we discover it? But how does it get also enriched by the uh, communication with other um, intelligent beings like humans. You know, uh, for AI to be useful in the real world, we'll need to have machines that not just translate, but actually understand natural language. And we're really not there. Uh, we've made a lot of progress and in terms of the understanding ability, but uh, I believe that uh, we have much more to go and that it's, it's actually also feasible. Great, thank you. And so let's move on to the next question. Um, how Tian Ma, uh, I've unmuted you. Uh, would you like to ask Hi. your question? Interoperability is quite important in some areas like health care with deep learning. It can provide some explanations and knowledge learned by neural network. And there is a problem. How can we get trustworthy explanation? It's hard to get enough labels, so we have similar supervised learning. Similarly, it's not easy to get enough experts to judge such explanations because it's too expensive. Knowledge graph may be a solution, but I want to ask, how can we get trustworthy interpretable results with less or no domain knowledge, which means we can get it just by the data in your network? All right, I'd like to say something about this question, uh, about interpretability and, and trustworthiness of AI and so on. Um, what I believe is that in the world around us, there are different aspects of how it is structured and how it changes. And some of these aspects can be uh, modeled with the kind of um, dense uh, neural nets that um, require huge number of parameters and capture very, very complex dependencies, but that are not, that this kind of knowledge is hard to verbalize. You know, it, it, and then everything that we call intuitive it falls in this category. Um, and then of course, there are aspects of the world, which is what I've been talking about in my talk, which um, can be reduced to uh, uh, sequences of, uh, uh, you know, applications of, of simple rules or rule-like um, um, 
uh, reasoning and that can be communicated with language. But that's one part of uh, what our brain captures about how the world works. And it's not sufficient to explain all of our intelligence. And in particular, what a lot of what humans do is, is hard to reduce to uh, a verbalizable knowledge. That's why a Go champion cannot really explain um, why he's choosing a particular uh, position. Uh, even though he might tell a story, it will be a very incomplete story. So, so there's just a, 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 a fundamental limit to what can be um, uh, verbalized and, and thus explained. On the other hand, there are other ways that we can get trust. For example, the way we trust a human being is, well, first of all, the, the other, the human being is like us. So that gives us a lot of information, but also that human being might be performing well at some tasks. So we, we do exams, we, we, we evaluate people, and that gives us clues about uh, how trustworthy they can be. And similarly for machine learning, we can run tests. We, we can you know, see how well they do on, on test set or how they do in a new distribution, whatever is the setting that we care about. Yeah, on, on this point, uh, I have a bit of a sort of an orthodox uh, position about explainability and things like that. There's a lot of things that we use in society that are very useful to society, and yet we, we basically have no idea how they work. So a good example of this is certain drugs like uh, lithium. So lithium is the main drug that's used to uh, control the symptoms of uh, bipolar di disorder. And uh, nobody has pretty much any idea of how it really works. It's a very simple atom. It's not even a molecule, right? Uh, and somehow it has an effect on the brain that seems to uh, seems to work. Now, uh, there is decades uh, of uh, you know empirical results on the use of lithium on millions of people, and you know it's been shown to uh, uh, to work on the symptoms. There's no theory behind it, essentially. So there's a lot of things like this that that we do as societies, and and the way we deploy those techniques or those those systems is that we test them very very thoroughly. And so we could do the same thing with machine learning systems. Uh, and in fact, we do this with airplanes, we do this with cars, we do this with everything, right? With, with drugs, obviously, uh, with all kinds of uh, procedures of, of various types. And so, uh, uh, you know, having sort of a, a open, uh, fair uh, uh, protocol for, for testing systems before deploying them, particularly in safety critical situation, is the right, the right thing to do. And we already have those for all the domains where safety is critical regardless of whether the system we deploy is AI based or not. And so I don't think there's any special provision to, uh, to, to do there. Now, that said, uh, there are certain situations where you, you, you know, it's, it's useful for uh, AI systems to kind of produce explanations and things like that, or it's even required legally, um, but that's a relatively small number of applications. Great, uh, thank you. So we have many hands that have raised in the session. But unfortunately, we are running out of time. Uh, so now let's uh, just have our closing question. Um, so as we end, uh, as a learning for everyone, uh, uh, Yang and Yoshua, what paper or a book would you recommend everyone to read? Ah, um, I have one book that I, I like very much. Uh, it's, by, it's, it's one of the books that written by Richard Feynman. Uh, Richard Feynman uh, wrote or, or had people helping write a number of different books. Uh, you know, some are textbooks, you know, the, the lectures in physics, and some are, you know, biographical uh, things uh, uh, about his life and, 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 and how he became a scientist. But there's one book that's kind of somewhere in between that explains a very complex scientific uh, concept to very wide audience without assuming any kind of uh, mathematical background and the title of that book is QED that means quantum electrodynamics okay so that's a kind of a, a, a field of quantum mechanics that explains you know the dynamics of uh, electrons and charged particles and stuff like that uh, and he explains there without any mathematical uh, uh, concept basically uh, you know how uh, you know in quantum mechanics you can have you know multiple paths being followed by the a particle because it's really a wave and, and he explains how that works by, you know, images and intuitions. And, and that explains, you know, why the sky is blue, why you see iridescent uh, colors on a, you know, oil film and, 
and all kinds of different things that you know you would not necessarily have explanations for. I found this this really book this little book fascinating because it gets to the core of really what is at the source of an idea, which usually is very simple, uh, and then you can make it complicated with complicated math if you want. But really, you should understand what the underlying intuition is before you do the math. Uh, the math comes later. Sometimes the math suggests the intuition, but that's actually fairly rare. Most of the time, you see all the way around. Uh, so I like this book in the sense that it, it really sort of gets to the core of what is uh, a complex conceptual idea and how you can explain it in simple, in simple terms. Um, well, I guess there are many books that I like. Uh, so one that is most connected to the talk I gave is um, the book uh, by Danny Kahneman, um, Thinking Fast and Slow, which I think gives a very accessible and interesting introduction to the, the uh, system one and system two that I've been talking about. Um, I would also recommend for those who haven't yet read it, read it the uh, books uh, that uh, 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 Harari wrote, uh, starting with Sapiens and then, and then the uh, uh, other ones, which uh, I think help us put things in perspective and, and be critical of um, uh, our beliefs about, about society and, and how things work in the world. So thanks. Uh, great. Uh, thank you. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining the session. And uh, thanks, uh, Yan and Yushua, again, uh, for this wonderful and uh, insightful session. We have many questions from the audience. And for the audience uh, members, please go to Rocket Chats, put your questions there. And as Yan and Yushua have time, they will um, answer questions on Rocket Chats and interact with the audience. Thanks, everyone, for this wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Don, for hosting Thank this. This was, uh, this, was, this was fun. Yes, care, thanks. Bye. Thank you.